Hello, everyone. Welcome. We are so excited to have you here for our first program for our very full slate of programs for Scrapyard Innovators of Recycling. My name is Ellie Gettinger. I'm the Education Director at Jewish Museum Milwaukee, and I am delighted to welcome you to this virtual program. Um, a few housekeeping notes. Um, if you have technical challenges during the presentation, please use the chat feature to let us know um, and someone from the programs team will attempt to assist you. Um, your microphones are gonna remain muted. So if you have questions for the Q&A, uh, please just put those in chat and we will make sure we get those out to John. Um, many of you have donated already to support this program. If you haven't and were, are able to, we ask that you donate uh, to the museum so that we can continue to offer exciting programs like this. I also want to thank our funder, the Wisconsin Humanities Council, for making sure that programs like this are possible throughout the run of this exhibit. They are um, a program of the National Endowment for the Humanities, and uh, we, we count on their support to ensure that we can put fine, high-quality humanities programs like this into the community. Scrapyard was the work of much research. And as we started doing our research, we connected with uh, John Pollock, who's done extensive research on Wisconsin scrap industry. And so I'm really excited to kick off our, um, our slate of programs with John today. Um, he is the chair of the history department at Madison Area Technical College. He earned his PhD in history from the University of Wisconsin-Madison in 1999. And he's the author of Wisconsin, The New Home of the Jew, 150 Years of Jewish Life at the University of Wisconsin-Madison. He's the co-editor of The Voice of the People, Primary Sources on the History of American Labor, Industrial Relations, and Working Class Culture. Um, and he was a consultant on this exhibit. Um, he also consulted, as I said, on our showing. He's the author of two articles and numerous presentations on the history of Jewish scrap dealers and he has personal uh, connections. He actually is descended from scrap dealers in Southern Ohio. So without further ado, I turn it over to John Pollock. Thank you. Well, uh, well, thank you, uh, Ellie, for that, uh, for that introduction. Uh, it's great to be back, uh, though virtually, uh, with the Jewish Museum in Milwaukee. I've uh, talked, uh, talked there a few times. It's always been real enjoyable. Um, I'm going to uh, share my screen here, my slide up. Oops. There we go. Um, play that. There we go. Uh, so uh, today's talk is entitled "Built on Scrap Part One: uh, Wisconsin History and Scrap Industry." Um, and uh, before I get started, I just want to give uh, some thanks. Uh, thanks to Ellie, Molly, Jay, and Cassie uh, at the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee, and and all the crew who uh, went out and conducted interviews. Um, and uh, collected artifacts for the exhibit. Uh, it was truly a, a magnificent job um, of, of research there. Uh, I'd also like to thank the exhibit's curator, Zachary Paul Levine, uh, for emailing me about this project uh, about six years ago, um, that he was uh, putting something together and wanted to, uh, wanted to hear from me, uh, my ideas about it. I'd like to thank the Jewish Museum uh, Maryland staff uh, who first mounted this exhibit and invited me out there to give a talk in November, 2019. Um, and big, big thanks to all of you who contributed to this exhibit, uh, both the individuals and foundations who helped make it possible, as well as those of you who sat for interviews, uh, shared your artifacts uh, with the Jewish Museum of Milwaukee. Um, very excited to bring this uh, to Wisconsin for reasons uh, that you'll be able to see uh, over the course of my talk. Um, so one of the things that's really important about the history of, of Jews and scrap metal and the industry in particular uh, is the importance of reputation. Um, that this is something that came up in, um, uh, in autobiographies and in interviews uh, with scrap dealers. Um, and for those of you who aren't able to see this real closely, because I know some of you are watching on your phone, um, I just want to read uh, what, what is on this advertisement. This advertisement ran in Waste Trade News, uh, early trade publication of the scrap industry uh, in May of 1916. Uh, the ad reads, uh, there's metals uh, and boxes on, on the upper part of both sides. Uh, and then it says the house of good reputation, metals in a little pyramid shape. <clears throat> then it reads, shrewd metal dealers look upon making their shipments of metals to the house of good reputation. Judge from those who ship regular. Why not get in line and write for our daily quotations? 
why you should keep in touch with us because the active organization and the object of the most effective means yet known of achieving results. Shipping your metals to the House of Good Reputation, Progressive Metal and Refining Company, Milwaukee. Um, so this ad really emphasizes uh, a point about how the scrap industry operated, uh, that it operated on reputation, um, that the uh, different classifications for different types of metals, uh, for number one iron, number two iron, et cetera, um, there weren't set standards for these things, that scrap dealers uh, judged uh, the metals that were coming in, what grade exactly is this metal, and they sorted them accordingly. Um, and people's business extended based on their ability to deliver uh, the minerals of the specific type uh, that was desired uh, and to do so promptly uh, and make it uh, uh, uniformly high quality material. Uh, so reputation was really important there. Uh, the scrap business is a classic example of a business that ran on handshake deals, uh, that oftentimes was personal connections that bound processors to collectors and then on to uh, industries that use the scrap. Um, and the other part of reputation uh, kind of worked the other way. Uh, reputation of scrap dealers among the general public. Uh, the talk I'll be giving in late January, we'll go into this in more detail, uh, when I look at the image of scrap dealers in American popular culture. Um, but scrap dealers also kind of struggled with their reputation outside of business. Uh, the scrap industry had a somewhat unsavory uh, reputation uh, for much of its existence. Um, and scrap dealers, uh, by creating trade associations, by doing charitable work in their communities, uh, it was a constant struggle to kind of burnish their reputation uh, and establish themselves as people with good reputation, as on this slide. Uh, this slide also, uh, Progressive Metal and Refining Company, um, was uh, one of the businesses of the Sadek family in Milwaukee, uh, located on the south side. Uh, Sadek's, of course, have gone on to uh, great degrees of prominence uh, and, uh, and reputation uh, in Milwaukee Jewish circles. So one of the questions that often comes up in my research is, um, uh, given the, uh, the predominance uh, of Jews in the scrap industry, and by scrap industry here, I'm talking about scrap metals, uh, also scrap paper. Uh, I don't think it's much of a stretch to extend that definition to uh, used clothing and used furniture, um, and even later on onto military surplus. That the, the whole business, series of businesses that operated on the concept of collecting goods that other people didn't want, finding a way to sort and classify and repurpose them and resell them at a profit. So the question, so for people who aren't familiar with this, and, and generally in my research, people kind of divide into two categories. Uh, there are um, people who, um, who uh, have family in the business, and they say, well, of course, this was a, a Jewish business, uh, that their parents maybe met that way, or they had many generations in it. Uh, there are other people who had absolutely no idea, and it strikes them as a complete random sort of happenstance, how on earth did Jewish people end up uh, in this business? Um, so for people in the second category, um, the, the rationale for that is, uh, is as follows, and there are multiple uh, reasons for this. Um, then first of all, uh, back and going back through European history, going back to the earliest examples we have of Jews in secondhand businesses, uh, we've got reports of Jews in Italy in the 1400s uh, who were dealing in secondhand clothes and secondhand goods. Uh, sometimes this uh, secondhand dealing came about through, uh, through running pawn shops. Uh, where people left stuff on pledges, and uh, if they weren't able to make good on their pledges, uh, pawnbrokers could resell them. Uh, oftentimes, the goods that people left behind needed some kind of repair or alteration uh, to make them saleable. Um, Jews who worked in, uh, who ran taverns, which was a big economic niche for Jewish people in the Russian Empire, uh, oftentimes tavern keepers uh, uh, had to, uh, when they tried to collect from customers, uh, try to settle their bar bills, their customers didn't have the money to pay, uh, but instead, they exchanged goods. They said, "Well, I, I don't have the I don't have the cash on me, uh, but you can take this coat I don't want. You can take this other stuff that I don't want, and then they could repurpose that and resell it." Uh, so there was something of a there, there's kind of a Jewish uh, economic tradition of dealing in secondhand goods uh, that was in, that ha that was going on in Europe long before large numbers of Jewish people came to the United States. Additionally, peddling uh, had been a uh, a major Jewish economic niche both in Europe and in the United States. In the United States, the best examples of uh, peddlers who became uh, successful uh, are many of the country's department store chains uh, that began in the 19th century uh, with German Jews who went door to door uh, across different parts of the United States, uh, selling goods, uh, moving up from uh, carrying a pack on their back to having a, a horse, to having a horse and wagon, 
to opening a store, to opening multiple stores, that peddling was an, was an American Jewish success story throughout the 19th and into the early 20th centuries. But the, uh, the period of large scale Jewish migration to the United States, the period when many of our ancestors uh, in this room right now, uh, when our families came to the US from the 1870s uh, through the mid 1920s, beginning in the 1890s, um, mining in the United States uh, had gotten most of the minerals that were easy to get. Uh, just a, a brief, very general overview of mining economics. When, when you're trying to get minerals out of the ground, um, there's always this kind of trade-off that if you, if you had enough processing, you could find like tiny trace amounts of precious minerals in any kind of random clump of earth. But the question you have to face is, is it worth it investing in the machinery and the processes to extract that tiny bit of mineral from a bunch of other stuff you don't want? Um, by the 1890s, yeah, there was still iron ore in places that were relatively close to major population centers and existing railroads. But that ore was there in very small quantities. Uh, there was more ore, there was more iron ore, there were more minerals in places further away from major settlements in the United States, places like uh, Yukon Territory in Canada and Alaska and so forth. And so mining operations, mining operators had to kind of figure out, is it really worth it to try to build a railroad line up into Alaska, up into, up into northern Canada, uh, to get at uh, the minerals that are up there and then find a way to induce people to go uh, up toward the Arctic Circle and so forth? Or is it easier to use time-tested means of recycling existing metal, uh, of smelting it to melt it down, to make uh, new, uh, new steel out of old iron. At the same time, uh, regarding the paper industry, um, American uh, paper mill owners had counted on a boundless supply of timber uh, in places like Wisconsin and Northwoods of Wisconsin and the UP of Michigan and Minnesota. Um, but by the 1890s, those areas were getting clear cut, that the original old growth forests had been increasingly cut down uh, it takes decades for a tree to grow to large size, uh, large enough that it's profitable to be chopped down and made into uh, made into board, uh, made into uh, boards, made in, pulped uh, and made into paper. And so uh, there also there were still virgin forests to the north in Canada, uh, up in the Rocky Mountains, but there also there were significant costs involved in trying to get the lumber out of those areas to existing paper mills in places like the Fox Valley in Wisconsin, in places like Southern Ohio, where my family's business was set up. Um, so uh, at the same time, there were methods of making uh, old paper, new paper from old, uh, the process of paper mache, um, taking, uh, taking old paper and pulping it and making new paper out of it, especially if you're talking about things like industrial papers, if you're talking about cardboard boxes, uh, if you're talking about paper that doesn't, that's not like high quality business stationery, then yeah, that's you, you, if it's a, if it's a little rough, like that's totally okay. And the question was, um, how would that? Uh, how could paper mills? How could steel mills get uh, the uh, the the pre existing materials that they needed to make new steel and make new papers? Well, as I mentioned uh, a few minutes ago, um, Jews who had come to the United States uh, from Russia and Eastern Europe in the 1880s and 1890s. Uh, moved into the pre-existing peddling niches that existed before them. Um, and uh, what they found was once there was this demand, once word got out that mill owners were looking for, for old iron, for old newspapers, for rags, for things like that, this made peddling a whole lot easier. Anybody who's ever had to try to sell something door to door knows it's very difficult. People don't like being disturbed. Uh, they resent strangers coming up and interrupting their dinner or whatever is going on. And they're often very skeptical customers to face. And you've got to have just like a really strong uh, tolerance for rejection and a really strong uh, like, like belief in the stuff that you're selling uh, to put it over and sell that stuff to a skeptical audience. Um, many people who started peddling left after a short time. They went to work in factories. They did almost anything except that because it was they got tired of having people slam their doors in their faces and say insulting things to them. However, if you're going door to door, and you're offering to buy stuff from people, or if you kind of do both, if you start out trying to make a sale, trying to sell people some paperback books or stationery or what have you, and then in the course of the conversation say, oh, you know what? I noticed there was an old plow in your front uh, as I was walking up here. Uh, it seemed to be kind of rusting in the field. Can I buy that from you? 
Or if you're looking over someone's shoulder and you see there's a pile of old newspapers, there's a pile of rags on the front porch, and you say, I'd, I'd like to buy that pile of rags you got over there. Lots of people would say, wait a minute, I can't charge you for that. That's, I was going to throw that out, and I just haven't gotten around to it yet. Let me help you get that out of here. You're like doing me a favor. Thank you. Um, and for people who consistently produced large, like for households that produced paper scrap and rags and so forth, they might even say, you know what, we, we tend to get a bundle like this every couple of months. Could you come by in a couple of months and do this again? Peddlers would say, yeah, absolutely. Uh, for peddlers who did the same thing, who visited factories and noticed large amounts of factory scrap kind of sitting there, like uh, defective items, pump, defective steel put out by a steel mill, um, or uh, other rags and scrap created in industrial processes, they came up and said, hey, can I, can I buy this from you? And again, industries were like, get this out of here. It's taken up space. Uh, in the case of rags, it's flammable. Thank you for picking this up. Can you come by again in two weeks when we, not, when we have another pile? So, uh, so offering to buy from strangers was much better for lots of people than trying to sell to strangers. And the question of who will collect the scrap based on uh, the points I've already identified around the turn of the 20th century, the people who collected the scrap were often Jewish entrepreneurs. Collecting scrap was a relatively easy business to get into. The barriers to entry were low. Uh, as you can see in the photo uh, up here on the slide, um, this uh, is a slide of one of the holdouts, uh, Saul Weinstein, uh, in a uh, photo caption, the last peddler in Milwaukee. This is from 1958. Uh, so even though scrap dealers by 1958 uh, had bought cars, had bought trucks, were, were driving around. Saul Weinstein was still a holdout, traveling by horse and buggy. Um, and so he's kind of an example of how peddling looked even 50, 60 years before. If you look closely on his wagon, uh, he's, got, uh, he's got mattresses on there. He's got what looked like some old clothings, kind of general stuff they had collected from people that they no longer wanted. So this was kind of the entry step. Uh, if you were able to get an, an older horse, if you're able to, you can see this wagon is in pretty rough shape. If you're able to pull those things together, you're able to collect large, num large, large amounts of scrap. Um, oops. So um, to continue on, um, the, uh, the set of business cards I've got up here, uh, and again, thank you to all the people who, uh, who went through your private collections and donated these. These are, these are priceless. Uh, these give us a sense of the... Um, of the different kinds of, uh, of scrap that were out there. Um, that, uh, that if we look at the, at the top right, uh, we've got Hyman Katz and Marinette. Uh, and Katz was kind of involved in everything. Um, he, uh, he was, he was uh, involved in buying livestock, which was another Jewish economic niche, especially in Northern Wisconsin, in the Appleton area and small towns north of there. Uh, so as a livestock buyer who's willing to buy cattle, calves, and poultry, uh, but then also uh, on the lower uh, left-hand side of that of his business card, uh, he's also willing to buy metals and wool and hides and rags. So really kind of an all-purpose dealer. And in small towns like Marinette, people like, country, uh, people like Hyman Katz and his contemporaries across Wisconsin and across the United States um, dealt in scrap uh, with a description of being a country shipper. Uh, so these are people who worked out in the country. They collected lots of different cast off items uh, to repurpose to send lots of different places. Uh, working as country shippers was often people's first entry into the scrap business, kind of collecting everything unwanted, whether we're talking about metals or hides or rags um, and, uh, and, and trying to find markets for these things. If we move left, uh, we look at the first of the Schenken brothers business cards. Uh, they were down in Sheboygan. Uh, and you can see that the Schenken brothers did not collect um, what, what you might call like animal scrap. They didn't collect hides and skins. Uh, in my research into scrap dealers, uh, many scrap dealing families who dealt in hides at some point, that was often the first thing to go. Uh, the market was pretty volatile. Um, storing the scrap, trying to uh, cure leather and so forth, uh, cure hides to make them into leather, uh, smelled horrible. Um, that it was deeply, for a lot of people, they found it deeply unpleasant to work with that kind of scrap. And as soon as it was feasible, they got out of doing that. So Schenken Brothers perhaps had gotten to that point by the time this business card came out. Uh, you can see a little while later, uh, looking at the more modern typeface and the fact that there's now an area code below it. Um, at that point, they had gotten rid of the paper and rag operation and they had specialized in iron and metal. This also uh, was a step that many scrap dealers took 
uh, who additionally dealt in lots of different goods, focusing more narrowly on, uh, on metals. And then finally to the right, uh, you've got the more recent uh, Schuster Metals card, um, where they're promoting themselves as proce processors and brokers and consultants uh, for people uh, with, with metal uh, to sell. Um, so this, uh, this kind of progression shows us how, uh, how over time scrap dealers came to specialize uh, more narrowly in specific types of scrap material. Um, so uh, over here, so on, on this slide, I wanted to show um, some of the sources and markets uh, for the spectrum of scrap in Wisconsin. Uh, that it's a good question, along with why did Jews get into this? Why was Wisconsin important? And I contend that Wisconsin really had markets for like most of the kinds of scrap out there. Uh, so for instance, if we look at the, the demand for scrap iron and other metals, when we're talking about the early to mid 20th century, places like uh, Kenosha and Racine, and of course, Milwaukee and Sheboygan and Manitowoc, these are all major manufacturing centers. There's steel being produced there. Um, and in order to, uh, to keep the mills going, steel mill owners needed a steady supply of scrap iron and other metals. Uh, so the markets for that are in the whole Lakeshore area, not to mention for um, scrap dealers toward southern Wisconsin, uh, Chicago would have been a large and ready market as well. Um, the market for scrap paper and rags, uh, people I've met over the years uh, from uh, who have uh, roots in scrap dealing in Wisconsin, uh, there are quite a few families here who dealt in scrap paper, maybe some of you are here today. Uh, my own family, this was one of the lines we had in southern Ohio, another paper making region. Scrap paper and rags collected across Wisconsin uh, could go to paper mills in the Fox Valley and elsewhere in the state. Um, that also, the, the history of the Fox Valley through the late 20th century uh, was driven, a big part of the economy in that, in that region of the state uh, was driven by the paper industry, by paper mills that needed a steady supply of scrap paper and rags coming in to keep production going. Uh, for hides and skins and so forth, um, the markets for these were a little more esoteric and people had to look a little harder some of the areas included soap making. Uh, one of the first uh, Jewish families in Madison, the Kalin family, uh, ran their scrap, uh, turned their scrap operation into a soap making business uh, before 1900. Um, other dealers in uh, in Wisconsin uh, collected bristles uh, from the from the uh, slot from and 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 hides from slaughterhouses uh, and used that used those to sell to companies that made leather goods uh, or uh, or industrial scrubbers that used uh, actual animal bristles. Um, on a consumer level, uh, people who dealt in used clothing and furniture uh, could sell to budget-minded customers across the state. Um, to people newly arrived in growing cities at that time, like Milwaukee or Madison or Racine or Kenosha, uh, people who had come to those cities from abroad or from the South with uh, big ideas and little money, they could shop at used clothing and furniture stores to save a few bucks. And finally, uh, the aftermath of World Wars I and II uh, created this huge supply of military surplus. Uh, that as World War II ended, uh, the United States was ramping up for a much longer conflict that suddenly ended. Uh, at a time when there was no concept of having a large permanent US military, military leaders wondered what to do with all this material that had been created for a war the US was no longer fighting. Scrap dealers stepped up and found markets for it. Uh, in the 1920s, uh, the first national vogue for camping um, came about through, uh, through uh, military surplus dealers who sold military surplus tents and canteens uh, and blankets uh, for people to get them to take up the, uh, the spare time occupation of camping. After World War II, the pattern laid after World War I came back into effect. Um, uh, the federal government in Washington, DC and its sites around the country offered boxcars full of military surplus goods uh, from combat boots to industrial papers uh, to, uh, to, to coats and jackets uh, for scrap dealers to come in, uh, purchase by the lot, purchase by the boxcar, uh, and take them back to their hometowns uh, for sale. Uh, so military surplus also became uh, a, a, a Jewish economic niche within the broader niche of scrap dealing. So I've been talking, I've been kind of conflating like scrap dealers and Jewish entrepreneurs this entire time. And I can imagine some of you are asking, well, just how Jewish was the scrap business? Here are a few measures. Uh, in 1920, 88.5% of the scrap yards in the five largest Wisconsin cities, uh, at the time, Milwaukee, Racine, Kenosha, Superior, and Madison, were owned by Jewish operators. That's overwhelming market penetration. Um, 
Other, uh, other anecdotes about this, the clipping that's on the slide here uh, uh, from the Wisconsin Jewish Chronicle of February 6, 1931, um, mentioned how, uh, how uh, Jewish scrap collectors in Milwaukee uh, were trying to limit the competition between them. Uh, that 1931, the, the Great Depression was, was, was kicking in um, and people were worried about bidding each other down to nothing. Um, so a group of uh, a group calling themselves the Jewish Junk Collectors Cooperative came together to divide Milwaukee into territories where people, members of the cooperative would each have a particular territory, uh, some number of blocks, some areas of, uh, of industrial areas in Milwaukee, and they would have exclusive right to collect scrap there so that people wouldn't be competing with each other and driving the prices down. The article mentions that in Milwaukee alone, uh, it cites that there were 300 Jewish junk peddlers. So this is 1930. So this is still in 1930, people were still doing what had been, what had been happening for decades at this point, going door to door or going to businesses, collecting the scrap to be taken somewhere and resold. On a national level, Fortune Magazine in February of 1936, uh, in, a, in a long and widely quoted uh, feature article entitled Jews in America, uh, a, an article designed to counter anti-Semitic charges that Jewish people were manipulating American industry, the, uh, the editors of Fortune Magazine looked at different, uh, different industries in the United States and determined that while the steel industry had a very small Jewish presence in terms of steel mills, 90% of the iron, scrap iron and steel businesses in the United States, according to Fortune, were owned by Jewish entrepreneurs. Uh, and they claimed that there was an even higher Jewish presence in scrap yards that dealt with non-ferrous metals, paper, rags, and rubber. Um, so by the 1930s, truly huge percentage of scrap dealers uh, were Jewish, making this, I'd contend, one of the most Jewish businesses in the United States. Uh, the World War II years brought about sort of a high water mark for the scrap metal business, for the scrap business in general, for paper and metals. Um, but as I mentioned in my first slide, um, the one of the struggles that scrap dealers often had uh, was the struggle to maintain a good reputation. Uh, that dealing in unwanted materials, it's like there was a, a public perception that kind of blurred the distinction between scrap and trash. Uh, that scrap, of course, is a material that can be reused and sorted and, and, and sold. Trash is stuff that nobody, nobody wants and has no use at all. Um, that uh, there were allegations of, uh, of criminal practices, large and small in the scrap business, and scrap dealers constantly had to fight against this. World War II provided a golden opportunity for scrap dealers to make their case because scrap was critically important for the war effort. Um, that as American industry kicked into high gear coming out of the Great Depression, uh, to build planes, to build tanks, to build the personnel carriers uh, that would propel the U.S. Uh, and its allies to victory in World War II, scrap dealers were front and center. Uh, scrap drives, as in this picture from Fond du Lac uh, and the Ben Sadoff Iron and Metal Company uh, demonstrates, um, scrap dealers uh, were a critical part of this. They were the places where people would deliver the scrap and sort it uh, and send it on uh, to factories uh, during World War II. So as a result, this put scrap dealers in the spotlight. Uh, scrap yards often were kind of marginal businesses within cities. Uh, scrap yards had to be located alongside railroads and often had to be located kind of on the outskirts of town. Uh, in order to save money on real estate costs, there was no need, unlike in the department store business, there's no need to have a scrap business on a busy corner in the center of town. Uh, that'd be a terrible idea. Instead, you want a scrap yard kind of out where land is less expensive, out along a railroad. And those locations resulted in scrap dealers being a little marginalized in local politics, World War II, and scrap drives within that kind of turned that around. Um, World War II also provided a big step in the transition uh, from junk to scrap. Like the word trash, the word junk is terribly loaded. Uh, junk, again, it's the kind of stuff that's, uh, it, it's a word we give to stuff that has no, no possible use as far as we can tell. It's stuff that's completely unwanted and extra and unnecessary uh, scrap, on the other hand, is material that can be reused in some fashion. Um, and uh, scrap dealers, starting in the 1920s, uh, fought an ongoing public battle to get their profession recognized as a profession, uh, to get scrap dealing recognized as a critical part of American industry. And finally, uh, scrap dealers also uh, were able to use their position and use their government contacts uh, acquired during World War II uh, to, uh, to learn about surplus auctions, to move into military surplus, uh, providing both surplus items for sale to consumers and also uh, surplus items for sale to, uh, to local industries. Um, 
after World War II, um, as, uh, as the end of World War II and the uh, increasing numbers of American Jews who went off to college and who settled in larger Jewish communities, in many small towns, scrap dealers remained among the few Jewish families who stayed in places like Baraboo and Fort Atkinson and Watertown. Um, and after World War II, scrap dealers became part of really civic life uh, in Wisconsin small towns. Um, in the Baraboo photo here on the left, uh, it's uh, Zachary Onical wearing the, uh, the Lions Club jacket, Lions Club vest you can kind of see there. Um, he was super active in service organizations in Baraboo, and you can see that the Lions dedicated a fountain in a Baraboo City Park in his honor, uh, brought the whole family together for, uh, for this. Um, in, uh, in the Fort Atkinson uh, example, this is uh, an article of, uh, by someone in Fort Atkinson uh, endorsing Milt Lorman for state assembly. Uh, Milt Lorman's father, Louis Lorman, uh, started the family's yard in Fort Atkinson in the 19 teens. Uh, through much of the 1920s and 30s, Lewis Lorman fought a pitched and long-term zoning battle with the city of Fort Atkinson about moving his yard to a better location. Um, there were all kinds of, of charges in there. It seems to have uh, uh, really uh, been really traumatic for him to have to fight this. Uh, but his son, who inherited the yard, uh, was able to use his connections in Fort Atkinson and use the new prominence of scrap metal uh, as part of Fort Atkinson economy to parlay that into uh, a successful, uh, several successful terms of office uh, in the state assembly. Uh, and in the bottom corner, um, it's, a, uh, it's an advertisement from 1954, uh, Loeb Salvage uh, participating uh, in Watertown Centennial. Uh, so there are also scrap industry, which historically had been kind of on the margins and so forth. Scrap industry was proud to be central uh, to Watertown's economy on the occasion of their 100th anniversary. So the story takes a somewhat darker and more difficult turn when we get to the 1960s. That even though the phrase, the original recyclers is more recent, even as far back as the, uh, if we go back to the, um, uh, to the Loeb uh, salvage um, a poster here, uh, the poster talks about how they're dedicated to the, to the conservation of the manufacturing world's natural resources. So before there was like a concept, before there was like a recycling logo, and there was, and long before there was any concept of like curbside recycling as something that you just do that just just happens, uh, along with along with garbage pickup, scrap dealers um, kind of cast themselves as people who were um, who were classically thrifty and finding ways to take what other people had thrown away and make some something valuable of it, and doing that to conserve natural resources. However, this vision of scrap dealing and scrap dealing's role in the environment ran headlong into a completely different perspective from groups like the US Environmental Protection Agency. Um, so I, I chose this slide here because I feel like this kind of shows both ways. If we look at this slide when it was produced, which is, uh, there's no date on it, but I'm thinking it's about the 1950s, that what we're looking at is a, uh, a, a municipal scrap pile that one of, the, one of the outgrowths of World War II and having scrap drives for American industry is that scrap dealers around Wisconsin and around the country from time to time would hold scrap drives for the benefit of local institutions. In this case, uh, this is from one of, and I'm not sure which yard exactly this is from, maybe someone can clear that up in the chat. Um, but there were, uh, in the 1950s, there were several scrap yards in kind of southeastern Wisconsin um, that held drives to fund uh, Oconomowoc Hospital. Um, and so this is a photo from one of those. So the idea was that working through the Kiwanis Club, uh, through a local service organization, uh, the scrap dealer or dealers created this pile, a place where people could just bring their scrap materials. Um, the scrap dealers would, uh, would take these materials, they'd sort them, they'd process them, they'd ship them out, and they'd donate the profits made from this to help build a hospital. So it's something, it's a noble cause. It's taking stuff that people didn't want, finding value in it, finding a place to use it, and doing this to benefit a local hospital. What could be wrong? However, if we, look, if we look at this from like a 21st century environmental angle, one of the items they're collecting are batteries. Like batteries are full of battery acid. As, as the metal components on batteries rust, the battery acid leaks out and leaks into the soil. Uh, you can see this scrapyard, this photo is taken during, uh, looks like it's maybe late spring based on how the snow on the ground looks here. Uh, over time, snow accelerates rust. Um, the battery acid, the other things leaching off of these scrap items 
uh, gets into groundwater and groundwater protection was one of the big causes of the EPA, of the environmental movement of, of providing access to clean water. The EPA's solution to pollution coming off of scrapyards was to demand payment from the current owners. For scrapyards, many of which had prided themselves on being multi-general organizations started by people who had little to offer but raw entrepreneurship and a drive to get ahead, scrapyard owners said, we, we had no idea this was going on. You know, my grandfather started this yard. He was not, uh, he was not an environmental geologist. Uh, he was not a chemist. He was not a physicist. He had no idea of this. We should not be held responsible for what people didn't know 100 years ago when the yard began or 50 years ago when the yard began. And the EPA said, this is coming off of your property, therefore it is your problem. I'd contend based on other talks I've given on, on the history of scrap and of the, of, the, of, the, of the EPA in the 1960s, this is an ongoing argument. This argument has not gone away. Um, and it's been something that uh, the scrap industry has, has had to kind of, kind of wrestle with. Um, and that starting in the 1960s, uh, it's something that really uh, change the scope of the scrap industry, and especially the role of small dealers within it. So one of the questions uh, that, that sometimes comes up is, all right, given this history, given this, uh, this, this set of industry, of related industries that had close to 90% uh, Jewish uh, penetration, one of the questions is, where did Jewish scrap dealers go? Um, so for starters, many of these businesses that I've talked about, they were family businesses. For people I know who run their own, who, who've inherited family businesses and run them, the question for a family business is always succession planning. Who's going to take it over? Um, for uh, uh, the scrap business um, was, uh, throughout its history, extremely volatile. That when you're, when you're dealing in scrap materials, you're kind of playing a real-life commodity market. Uh, you've got huge amounts of metal. You've got uh, large bundles of warehouses full of paper and rags on your property, and you're waiting for the price to get to a certain point where it's profitable to move it off and sell it. And that, and that waiting for that to happen and looking at this pile of stuff can be very stressful. Uh, that it's a volatile market. And for people who, want, who didn't want to take that kind of risk, who felt that they could find a sufficient financial reward um, in medicine, in law, uh, in academia, in other fields that didn't have this kind of boom or bust cycle to them that Scrap did, they didn't want to take over the family. They didn't want to take over the family yard. Additionally, Scrap businesses were subject to the same kinds of com competition and consolidation that we can see across American industry through the 20th century. Recall the slide from 1931. Uh, this far back there, uh, small scale peddlers in Milwaukee looking to collect scrap from people realized that there were too many people to sustain everybody. With 300 scrap peddlers in Milwaukee alone, uh, that tells us there were tons of people out there who were running truly marginal businesses and just couldn't keep that up, sold out to larger companies. Another big factor were environmental, environmental regulations, as I mentioned on the last slide, uh, that for small yards especially, environmental regulations were simply too onerous for them to, uh, for them to fix. Uh, if there was a multi-million dollar bill to do groundwater cleanup around a scrap yard um, that was relatively small scale, owners of that yard said, we're not going to make that kind of money in like 15 years. We don't have that. We're getting out of the business. Um, lots of former scrap yards uh, and scrap dealers branched out into businesses that didn't really deal with scrap particularly. Uh, there's, like a, there's like a link between businesses that sold used furniture and businesses that moved into new furniture. Um, as, uh, as cities expanded out of their older downtown areas, the real estate that scrapyards sat on suddenly became valuable. Um, when scrapyards started many cities, they were on kind of marginal land alongside a railroad uh, at the edge of town or, on, or, or outside of town in a nearby township. As cities expanded, that land became valuable. Um, as railroading decreased across the United States, uh, as railroads turned into bike paths and, and other uses, Having land, there, there was no longer land near a railroad, that land could be more profitably sold. Scrap dealers also, especially in, uh, in iron and steel, uh, in the 1950s and 60s began opening mini mills, uh, making their own steel mills, sort of keeping the scrap like another step, like actually recycling it and making steel out of it, uh, kind of rebranding themselves as steel companies as opposed to scrap yards. However, despite this consolidation, despite the obstacles both within families and from outside sources, 
bigger firms are still here. Um, firms like Alter Trading out of Davenport, Iowa, began as a small Jewish-owned firm uh, in the Quad Cities uh, that's expanded uh, to buy up uh, many of the smaller family yards throughout Wisconsin and the upper Midwest. So there's still like a small kind of Jewish tie to the scrap business around the state. There's still even a few smaller uh, outfits that are still family owned. Um, so it's not a story of complete and total extinction. There's still a few people flying the flag uh, in this case. All right, this, uh, this wraps up the, uh, the formal part of my talk. Um, I'm happy to, uh, happy to take questions from people. I'll call the chat up because uh, Ellie mentioned that's been, um, that's been enabled. So feel free to put your questions in the chat. Um, if you have like an extended thing you want to talk about, or you're kind of shy about uh, about putting stuff in there, I've got my email in the uh, in the last slide here. Feel free to shoot me an email. Uh, I'll be happy to talk to you about this stuff. I'm uh, I'm continually fascinated by it, and I know that in this overview, I couldn't possibly have captured everyone's story. There are outliers out there. I'm sure. I'm sure there are details I I missed uh, in the time allotted to me. Um, and so, uh, so I'm happy to, uh, to learn more about uh, this fascinating business. Thank you so much, John. I'm guessing that there'll be some questions in the chat. Go ahead, throw those in. But as we start out, just to, um, in thinking about um, kind of the relationship of peddlers to dealers to yards, you know, what was the, the thing in your research that would indicate that going from, you know, being a solo practitioner, a guy with a truck to being someone like say Miller Compressing who then has a you know, big yard. What are the, the ways in which the companies evolved? Okay, okay, yeah. So to like break that down uh, a little bit more. Yeah, so um, uh, I mean, I think a big part of it based on, the, on some of the families I've talked to um, came out like other businesses with consolidation through marriage. Um, that uh, I know that the, um, I've heard from, uh, from several people that the uh, Institute for um, Scrap Recycling Industries or ISRI, um, people kind of call themselves, uh, members of that call themselves Israelites, uh, kind of getting at the uh, heavily Jewish um, presence uh, at those meetings. And uh, that ISRI conventions were, uh, were for many years uh, kind of family oriented. Uh, that there were separate sections for, um, for spouses of scrap dealers, uh, and there were separate sections for the teenage kids of scrap dealers, and that they were kind of operate on the same, uh, same kind of logic as, um, as uh, temple and synagogue youth groups, uh, that there are ways for Jewish kids to get to know each other outside of a formal context and kind of hang out and maybe like make a little shit along the way and get together. Um, so I think that's one of the ways that uh, these larger organizations came together. Um, for uh, that uh, also, I mean, as, as far back as the 19 teens, uh, the waste trade news is full of want ads with people looking to sell their yards. Uh, as I mentioned before, it was a, it could be a very lucrative business. It could also be an extremely stressful business. And people who just gave up on that and wanted to go into some other line of work um, could put their yard up for sale. If they were really desperate to get out, that yard could be priced somewhat lower, someone who had more experience uh, someone who's a little more astute business-wise, drove a little harder bargain, et cetera, could snap up yards uh, that way, could just make a deal, come out and say, all right, I'll give you X amount of money for your yard, uh, and then get to know like, all right, who are the mills in this area, or if, or you know, can I ship this to the town where I'm based and bring this into the existing relationship I have with the steel yards and so forth. So I think that's how it kind of, that's how it kind of grew. Um, that there were just, you know, there, there were certain entrepreneurs who just had more, uh, who had some combination of luck and skill in these markets um, and were able to get ahead and were able to then look at their smaller and more struggling counterparts um, and kind of, you know, offer them uh, a chance to, uh, to sell out and then further grow from there. In your talks with, uh, you know, scrappers throughout the state, um, do you, when you're, and, and when you're talking to somebody from say, you know, the, at the Lormans in Fort Atkinson or the Loeb's in Watertown or, um, you know, any of these kinds of statewide Jewish scrappers, do they describe any kind of anti-Semitism? Like how does anti-Semitism fit into the- Yeah, no, it's, um, that actually came up quite a bit uh, in my conversations that uh, some of the families I talked about were like very, were still, like after leaving small towns, uh, we're still um, really reticent about me even like naming them in, in presentations and other research. 
Um, but yeah, as, as is often the case, I'd say with other things in Wisconsin, when we're talking about like ethnic diversity and so on, um, anti-Semitism is real covert, but it's there. Um, so oftentimes when we think of anti-Semitism, we think of like, we think of a clan, we think of, you know, someone spray painting a swastika on something. And that wasn't the case. Uh, more often I'd contend anti-Semitism was sort of a, uh, was sort of what, uh, what some scholars call a five o'clock shadow that descended over small towns, uh, where after, where during the day, um, yes, absolutely. Scrap dealers were welcome at, um, you know, weekly lunches with the lions and the Kiwanis and the Elks and the Masons and so forth. But after five o'clock, like nobody invited him to dinner. Um, and when Jewish families tried to reach out to, uh, to better connect with the people they met through their professional connections and service organizations and, and otherwise, the non-Jews were just always kind of busy that night and just never could quite find a time to come over. Um, one person I, I spoke to who grew up in a small Wisconsin town, a uh, child of a scrap owner, uh, said that their dad um, wanted them to be really active in like student council and student activities in high school as preparation for the networking they'd have to do when they were out in the business world. But their dad said, under no circumstances be treasurer. If a Jewish person is treasurer and things go bad, they're going to blame all the Jews. They're going to they're going to accuse you of horrible things. You can be the secretary, you can be the president, you can be the VP, you can be some other officer position, but do not run for treasurer, do not volunteer to be treasurer of anything. Um, so I think that's, that's often how it worked. It was uh, in, the, in the Lorman example, in the zoning battle that Lewis Lorman fought, and, uh, and this actually uh, ties into the question that uh, Marjorie Margulies asked in the chat. Uh, she was wondering, she mentioned that her family collected rags and scrap in the Haymarket neighborhood in Milwaukee, uh, and she wondered, was there no zoning? Um, zoning was like a huge contentious issue for scrap dealers uh, starting in the 19 teens and going like into the 1940s and even beyond. Uh, that initially, yes, that if we're talking about like, especially when the Haymarket neighborhood in Milwaukee was like the main Jewish neighborhood. Um, so that's like early 20th century. Yeah, that, any zoning laws that existed were not really enforced. Um, and there are kind of famous uh, photos. There was, um, uh, there, there are photos uh, uh, by uh, kind of progressive era reformers uh, concerned about like waste in public areas and so forth. And the people kind of push for zoning regulations were there photos of like Jewish companies, businesses uh, of like scrap metal stacked up in backyards. Scrap paper was one of, of particular, uh, particular concern uh, because paper is flammable, you know, in dry conditions um, when people are crowded together, if somebody is like lighting a cigarette and they throw a, they throw a lit match um, toward a warehouse that's toward a building that's that's cut, that's holding a bunch of scrap paper, that can be a conflagration, and then a whole neighborhood could be wiped out from that. Uh, so yeah, so zoning uh, was one of the one of the first obstacles that scrap dealers had to deal with. Um, there was a big battle in uh, in Madison around 1920 uh, that scrap dealers in Madison's Greenbush neighborhood uh, were holding on to scrap in their backyards before they were wealthy enough to buy land closer to the railroad. Um, and uh, the Madison City Council was trying to impose zoning uh, and the scrap dealers who hired uh, Madison's first Jewish attorney to speak on their behalf, uh, they said, the stuff we're holding isn't flammable. We don't have scrap paper at our houses. We have metals. Like nobody's gonna light a fire hot enough to melt like old plows and industrial scrap that's in our yards. It's not flammable, it's not a problem. Um, so yeah, so zoning was a huge issue and that's the issue that really uh, bedeviled um, uh, Lewis Lorman in uh, in Fort Atkinson um, that uh, Lorman actually saved uh, that court saved his ongoing correspondence between the city uh, he saved the petitions against uh, him expanding his yard and so forth um, from the uh, from the from the full article that I had in that uh, in that slide that mentioned Fort Atkinson um, it sounds again like people said a lot of stuff that wasn't written down uh, it was pretty nasty um, so yeah that's often how it worked out I mean, also, you know, there were ways that, that Jewish scrap dealers fit in, but that was always a concern that people had uh, was the anti-Semitism. It seems like from our research, too, we have a collection um, of a scrapper in Burlington, uh, the Lipton, I Lipton Company, yeah. where it's similar, the zoning issue becomes the thing where they're bringing in Milwaukee lawyers to then contend that it's, um, that it's uh, anti-Semitic, um, mm -hmm. that's in the 1930s. And similarly, as we're thinking about those kinds of questions of zoning, um, during World War II, we have a letter from Loeb Salvage 
where the district salvage chief is saying, you've got to let these people have their, their, um, their certification because this is, this is patriotic duty now. It's not about, you know, whether it's good or not for Watertown, it's good for the country. Right. Um, yeah. And, yeah and, and that also shows the, um, you know, the power of World War II, of scrap drives in World War II in helping scrap dealers kind of overcome some of these negative perceptions that they had. Uh, that that way it's the, you know, it's not just their ideas, it's not just their trade association, um, it's not just the attorney that they hired for this, it's the federal government is saying, it's the War Production Board is saying that scrap is a critical resource and everybody's got to chip in and do their part. With the kind of scrap piece of um, like that kind of World War, post-World War II economy up to like the 1960s, this is a tremendous shift in the, that period. You get this high of like, look at us, this is our patriotic duty to their polluters. This is, this is part of, you know, we the EPA need to regulate them. Um, what was the kind of sense nationally is, you know, and, and how, how, or just even locally, what were some of the stories that you get in that, in that period? Of I mean, the stories I've heard are, I mean, one that I've heard a lot um, and from different places, I heard it from someone in Wisconsin, I heard it from someone in Maryland when I was out there, um, was that uh, it, was a, it was a major blow. Um, the story I had heard was that there was, um, and again, I, maybe this happened, uh, maybe, maybe several people happened, maybe it's kind of come together as a sort of urban myth, but the, but the story I've heard is that um, there's a scrap dealer who was like second generation in the business, it was thriving and had been part of their local economy during World War, uh, really growing during World War II and after. Um, EPA came through in the late 60s and said, yeah, there's there's like $10 million of cleanup that's got to happen there. Uh, the owner said, I, you know, I don't have that kind of money on me and it's going to take me years to do that. And the EPA said, okay, then the fines are going to kick in at X amount per day. And the guy said, I can't afford that and so forth um, and proceeded to kill himself in his office. Yeah. Um, so again, I've never gotten a name on this. You know, I don't know, I don't know of individual people and maybe uh, people in the audience know of that and, and can put that in the chat. Uh, but it's a story I've heard often enough that it sounds like it was at least, there's a possibility this happened at least once or more than once. Um, and then it, it, and at any rate, it demonstrates the, like the, 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 the danger that scrapyard owners felt all of a sudden that there was, you know, as you said, there was this really rapid, um, you know, within one generation, this kind of turn of events uh, from scrap finally taking its place as a as respectable industry with a good reputation and critically important for defense purposes uh, it's becoming um you know kind of a you know kind of an environmental uh, hazard um so I, yeah so i think that had a that had a really traumatic effect on a lot of dealers i mean it's certainly you know i, I think it's also uh one of the areas that i'm that i i, I want to do more research into um, is the uh, is looking at scrap dealing and, and the history of scrap dealers and their families as an alternative to the stories we often tell about Jews in American politics. Mm -hmm. That oftentimes uh, Jews in politics, people talk about, oh, we had, you know, we were socialists back in the in the sweatshops, um, and we were union organizers, and we were socialists in the 1930s, and that's the roots of the affinity between American Jews and the Democratic Party. And so you ask the question, well, what about like? Jewish Republicans in the present time, like where, and, and Jewish political conservatives, like are they part of the story or what? And I'd contend that, that the experience with the EPA um, made lots of scrap dealers profoundly politically conservative, um, that it, uh, it really turned them off to the environmental movements. Um, I've heard of uh, several examples of people on, I've talked to people who, uh, when they were in college, uh, they were involved in recycling and sustainability issues, and they contacted their local scrap dealer uh, who was initially like really excited to be part of it and was really supportive. And then shortly before the event, they, you know, kind of sent out an email or contacted everyone and said, okay, so we've got you from this yard and we've got this person from the city and we've got this representative from the EPA. And once the name EPA was out there, the scrap dealer said, okay, no, I can't do that. Mm -hmm. um, and they're just like off the panel. Um, so uh, yeah, so it's a very different kind of environmental ethos. Um, and, uh, and so I'd, I'd contend, and again, I, like Lewis Lorman's papers are, are full of this. I mean, Lorman's, uh, you know, the clippings that wound up in there and so forth. Um, you know, it's like reading someone who was pretty hard right by 1960s and 70s standards. Um, so uh, by 1950s and 60s standards, I should say. 
Um, and so I think that's a, that's an important source of it, that it really had this impact of, of souring people on government activity and the role of uh, of the federal government in, in regulating business. Um, and it's a whole different story than one we often tell about uh, about Jews and the occupations they pursued and the politics that, that followed from them. Um, that is so interesting. As we're wrapping up, I just want, we have another lecture with John to look forward to in January. It's, we have both an opening lecture and a closing lecture. So if you could give us like a two second, whatever pitch on what to expect when we come back to you in January, that would be wonderful. Absolutely. So um, a big part of how, um, how, uh, the, how people made an association between Jews and scrap dealing uh, came through popular culture um, from uh, productions of, um, uh, Shakespeare's *The Merchant of Venice*, where Shylock is a scrap dealer uh, uh, calling for old rags and paper, uh, to uh, silent films uh, involving uh, heroic and sympathetic uh, uh, scrap dealing characters, uh, through the play and movie *Born Yesterday*, um, about uh, the uh, the kind of shady side of surplus dealing, um, uh, to uh, to the TV show *Sanford and Son*, uh, which, although *Sanford and Son* uh, notably has uh, uh, features a black family running a scrap, running a small scrapyard out of their house in Los Angeles. Uh, there's several episodes of Sanford and Son where uh, clearly they're supposed to be sort of Jewish, or they intersect with Jewish people in funny and surprising ways, kind of Judaizing uh, the uh, this otherwise uh, black TV show. Um, there's a comic, there's a, a comic book superhero Ragman who's a scrap dealer and so forth. So there are all these different ways that uh, Jewish scrap dealers have made their way into popular culture, influencing. Um, and mirroring ideas about scrap dealers, both for uh, in positive and negative ways. And that's what I'll be talking about in January. Can't wait. We're so excited. We're always happy to work with you, John. Thank you so always much for sharing thanks so with much. us today. Thank you um, all for, for coming out. Thanks for, uh, thanks for being here today. And for those of you um, who are, you know, uh, you guys are all such wonderful attendees. I just want to let you guys know what else is coming up. Um, on October 26th, so that's next week, Tuesday, we have a one of our Global Museum Passports. This is a virtual tour of the Museum of the Southern Jewish Experience. This museum opened in May, it's in New Orleans, and it explores the history of Southern Jewry. And we're really excited that our tour guide for this is Milwaukee's own Lizzie Meister, who is their program director. Um, also coming up on October 31st, you will not be scared by this. It is our community electronic recycling day. If you have those cell phones sitting around, uh, you know, tablets uh, or uh, computers, any of that stuff, um, we are working with NJT Automation Salvage and Industrial Electronics Recycling uh, to do on-site um, of old electronics. You can bring it in. You can get a two dollar discount on uh, your admission. So. We are so excited to be able to offer those things and we look forward to seeing you guys at future programs. If you have any questions or comments, throw them last minute. Oh, except no TVs I hear. Thanks, Patty. Um, <laughs> before you bring in your TVs, no TVs. Um, and we'll, we're excited to continue to, to have Scrapyard. Please come and check it out. It's an amazing exhibit.